Sure. You guys click on that. Sure. Okay. Today we're going to look at one very short paragraph, and it's about wisdom. Remember when I started this study, I said that the book of James is similar to the book of Proverbs. Uh, there's also some other wisdom literature. Uh, I'm going to show you in a chart that's found in some of the apocryphal books. So there's similarities between Proverbs, there's similarities between uh, the book of wisdom in the Apocrypha, and there's similarities with the book called Ecclesiasticus in the Apocrypha as well. And uh, this paragraph is interesting because it talks a little bit about two different kinds of wisdom, if you can call it that. Uh, it's uh, wisdom from above and wisdom from below. And so if you have your study sheet in front of you, we'll do an introduction and uh, get into it. We're going to take a look at verses 13 through 18 of chapter 3 as we finish this chapter. But it's a part of a section that goes from 313 through 410. And this is a uh, cohesive unit that's addressing topics like gentleness and peace and humility, but it is also related to wisdom as well. And we'll see that both tonight and next Wednesday night as well. So in these two sections, you might say that verses 13 through 18 is kind of the theology of wisdom. And then verses one through 10 of chapter four is more like the application of it. So it's kind of inopportune that uh, the chapter vision comes between these two paragraphs here, but let's take a look at the one we're going to look at. Beginning in verse 13 of chapter 3, James says, who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. So that's kind of the theological uh, insight behind this idea of wisdom. And I think it goes to basically the attitude of the heart. Where's the wisdom coming from? Is it from above? It reflects in our heart attitude. If it's from the earth, it's reflected in our heart attitude. So it's almost as if when we look at the subject of wisdom, where there's kind of like two competing sources of wisdom. And we can know that it comes from above if it leads to gentleness and peace and humility and the qualities that are mentioned uh, in verse 15. So Let's take a look at the first section, verses 13 through uh, 18 tonight, and then next week we'll take a look at verses 1 through 10 of chapter 4. So if we had a thesis for this paragraph, it might be summarized like this. Going back to earlier chapters in James that's talking about maturity, mature believers do good works in the gentleness that comes from true wisdom. And that's found in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. So wisdom has some element of uh, peace about it, has an element of being able to communicate gently with diplomacy, those type of things. Uh, we might think about the difference between wisdom and understanding a little bit, although maybe in this paragraph, we might say that they're one in the same. Notice verse one, it says, who is wise, that's wisdom, and understanding among you. So I'm kind of curious, if you had to distinguish between wisdom and understanding, 
How would you differentiate between the two? Any thoughts on that? Question. Wisdom and understanding. Well, one might have to do with knowledge and the other might be how to put that knowledge into practice. So you can have an understanding of something, but yet at the same time might not have the wisdom to put that knowledge into effect. So let's take the idea of learning how to drive a car for a moment. So you can have a knowledge about how a car works and how you're to drive a car. Um, all of us at one point went through driver's education and we had to look at a manual and we had to take a written test. And yet many individuals might be able to pass the written test, but having the wisdom to know what to do with that knowledge when you're actually out on the road is a different story. So you can read all about how to drive in the rain or in the snow, but until you actually have your hands on the wheel and you're able to take what you know and actually translate it into how to slow down, how to brake, how to maneuver uh, through such hazards as rain or wind or snow, it's not really a practical skill set yet. And I think that's important to keep in mind is there seems to be a difference between understanding and wisdom in the fact that if you go all the way back to the book of Proverbs, wisdom is a skill set. It's how to live life skillfully more than to live life with a head full of knowledge. So uh, you might know that I'm a big Jeopardy fan. And so I like to watch as many episodes as I can during the week. Um, there was an individual that uh, just had a great run for over a month. Matt Amodio is his name. He made $1.5 million, second uh, only behind Ken Jennings and the guy, uh, I can't remember his name. That was the Las Vegas gambler. Do you remember his name? Yeah. James Holsaw, thank you. Anyways, um, but it's interesting that last week, this other individual um, had more knowledge than he did in the categories. And so this new, this individual became the new champion. Now he's had a run for a week. Um, he doesn't strike me as the kind that might be able to have a long stretch over a month, uh, month's time. Yeah, but anyways, uh, the point is you can have all kind of knowledge, but at the same time, having an understanding of how things work is a whole different thing or the wisdom to put skill to it. So head knowledge and hand knowledge, you might say, are two different things. You can read all you want uh, about certain things, but until you know the shortcuts until you know um, some of the industry insights, you might not be able to do things well. So I think wisdom is knowing how to take knowledge and put it into practice. So you see that on the screen there. Um, so James is concerned about connecting wisdom with good works. You see it in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you show it by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. So now he's beginning to express how to do some of the good works that he's talked about previously in uh, this epistle of James. He's already talked about, um, you know, we are justified by works. Uh, it is a way of proving that our faith is genuine. Now he's talking a little bit about how to uh, put those good works into practice. And he's talking about gentleness and he'll later talk a little bit about humility as well. So gentleness and humility, not coming across as a know-it-all, arrogant, um, that, that's important to 
what we find here. So I'm using the revised standard version um, tonight, but um, some of you might have a different version. Can you, Esther, you have the NIV. Can you read verse 13 uh, of chapter three? Okay, so it you, you see there's a little bit of a difference in the translation. So in the NIV, it talks about humility, but here in the Revised Standard Version, he talks about it in terms of gentleness. So you'll notice here at the bottom of the slide, uh, in this context, there's two different words, uh, and I'm talking about the big section that goes all the way through verse 10 of chapter 4, um, and maybe that's why the Revised Standard Version um, does a little bit different translation than the NIV. Uh, the first word used in verse 13 here is pretus, but if I skip over to chapter 4, verse 6 and 10, uh, here's another word that is translated humility or humble. So in verse six, it says, but he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So these couple of different words, they could both be translated humility, but it's interesting that the Revised Standard Version in the chapter three reference translates pretus as gentleness. And um, that comes across in this paragraph as well. So I think there's this um, wonderful balance of humility and it comes out through gentleness that's trying to come across in this whole paragraph here, not coming across with an arrogance or a biting type of attitude, but coming across humbly, coming across gently. You have some thoughts on verse 13? So let's talk a little bit more about James as New Testament wisdom for a minute. So what is wisdom in the Bible? The word usually refers less to factual knowledge and more to skill. And I've already given you kind of an illustration of learn, reading about how to drive a car versus actually knowing how to do it on the road. It is more of a know-how than a know that. And I like that line. Um, it seems as though wisdom in the Bible is not so much um, about knowledge as it is about skillful living. So you see here on the screen, it says biblical wisdom deals with knowing how to live, and therefore it's a form of ethical instruction and not just a set of facts. So I think this plays out pretty importantly within Christianity, because a lot of times we're so concerned about accumulating a lot of knowledge, and um, yet at the same time, we might not know how to put that knowledge to use. And it seems as though the wisdom that is found in wisdom literature has more to do with this idea of ethical instructions. This is how you live this out. This is how you treat other people. This is how you use what you know. So notice here at the bottom of this slide, it says certain apocryphal books that teach similar moral maxims also influenced James. So when we ask the question, what is James background? What is his learning skill? Uh, and where is he drawing his knowledge? We already talked a little bit about uh, him echoing Jesus. And some of this echoes the book of Proverbs. There's two books that did, did not make it into the Protestant canon but it did in the Catholic Bible, Ecclesiasticus, which is also known as Sirach, it's around, written about 180 BC. And then the other is called the Wisdom of Solomon. It's written about 30 BC. And maybe these two books, along with Proverbs, and of course the teachings of Jesus is kind of the pool from which James is drawing 
uh, to put a lot of practical things in place in his epistle. So I want you to notice this chart for a moment. So here's a in very interesting thing. If you have a Bible that has an apocryphal uh, books in it, uh, you'll find them in between the Old and the New Testament. These apocryphal books uh, give to us further historical information, but there's also these type of writings that cover a lot of similar topics that are found in the uh, New Testament. But in particular, the book of James, you can go down the left side there and you can find all of these topics that are found in this little book. Patience, wisdom, doubt, trials, temptation, what uh, being uh, hearing more than talking, rich and poor, mercy, the brevity of life, uh, the rustling of money, the killing of righteousness, and prayer for the sick. Now, I want you to look at the column there. Notice how similar the topics are in this book called Ecclesiasticus. So um, if you were to do kind of a side-by-side -side study, and we're not doing that tonight, but if you were to do that, you would find very similar material between these two books on the majority of the topics. On the topics that Ecclesiasticus does not touch upon, it's interesting that the wisdom of Solomon does. So in that third column, you'll see uh, some of the references that parallel to James in his epistle as well. So this is just to help you see that when we think about New Testament writers, when we think about the way they write and what they draw off of, you can see that it's a wide swath of uh, cross-referencing that they often do. So James will also reference things in the Old Testament. We already looked at that a little bit when we talked about Rahab and, and that type of thing. But um, here is those books that we never touched as Protestants. So in uh, what we find is in, in um, the apocryphal books, there is beneficial material. Don't be afraid of them. I think we have been trained in Protestant circles to think they're anathema. No, they just didn't make it into the corpus of what we consider the biblical canon. But they can be important as we can see how they influence maybe later writings in the New Testament. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions or comments there? Okay, so verses 14 through 16, uh, he then starts to talk a little bit about what happens when we draw upon earthly, unspiritual, and even demonic uh, type of wisdom. So he doesn't pull any punches here. Uh, in verse 13 is his opening thesis. In verses 14 through 16, he says, but if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. Now, this word here that is translated bitter envy, that's an interesting word. The word is used only twice in the whole New Testament, and it's right here in the book of James. The other place that we saw it is in verse 11 uh, in chapter 3 of James. It says, does a spring bring forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish, or as the NIV, if you want that uh, salt water type thing. So it's interesting, bitter. Um, it's the kind of water you'd never swallow type thing. You'd spit it out. And that reminds me a little bit of the book of Revelation when Jesus talks about Laodicea, the church in Laodicea, being lukewarm and it's neither hot nor cold. And it's just kind of this type of water that you just want to spit out. So this idea of kind of bitter envy, the kind that 
you want to spit out is kind of driven by selfish ambition. And maybe that selfish ambition could be described as things like trying to achieve fame or status, recognition, success, comfort, enjoyment, or fortune, not for others, but for yourself. And um, what we find here is that bitter envy is a result because notice what happens in verse 16 for where there is bitter envy and selfish ambition, there's disorder. It seems as though things fall apart. And I think this can be true of a lot of different organizations, but since we're in church, let's mention the fact that it's so easy within churches to allow bitterness or envy or selfish ambition to drive the mission of the church that eventually it splits up, becomes uh, d- divisive, that type of thing. So um, here James is concerned, obviously, he's very early in the development of, of the church, um, and he's concerned about drawing upon uh, spiritual wisdom or wisdom from a above, as he mentions here, wisdom, such wisdom does not come from above, which implies that there is a wisdom that comes from above. So uh, we already saw back in chapter one, verse 17, when it says um, every good and perfect gift comes from above, and it's describing for us the idea of God's good gifts to us. And, um, and so here we find him kind of drawing back on that, uh, verse 17, every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So this idea of wisdom that comes from above does not inspire envy and jealousy and selfishness and and um, all these type of things that drive wedges between individuals. So maybe what James is getting at is other writers put it a different way. Maybe three adjectives that other writers use, in particular, Paul and John, talk about the world, the flesh, and the devil. And what we find is this triad here, pride and envy and selfish ambition, could correspond to the idea of the world and the flesh and the devil being the influences of the system that we're in. And, um, and what James will eventually say in verse four of chapter four is if you live this type of wisdom, there is a friendship you have with the world. And this friendship with worldly wisdom is often at enmity with God. So earthly wisdom comes sometimes from friendship with the world, and that friendship with the world is primarily driven by how can I succeed and get ahead and get what I want, rather than thinking about the whole, or we might say the common good that um, James is concerned about here. Some thoughts there, verses 14 through 16. Well, I noticed the... um end of 14 says do not boast about it or deny the truth so Mm -hmm. i think james wants us to realize that it's there and we need to make sure we act on it properly Mm -hmm. yep good point yep very good anybody else Uh, do not boast about what you know and how much you know that you're using for your own selfish ends, maybe. But what truth is he, does he have a particular truth in mind? And that might go back to verse 13, the truth of showing by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. So um, we might think of it as an umbrella term, truth, 
but he might have something in particular in mind here. And maybe what he has in mind is this type of life that reveals through humility and gentleness, um, the wisdom from above. Maybe that's the truth that he has in mind. And he's, he's saying, when you boast, when you're uh, boastful about your own ends and accomplishments, and if you're producing bitter envy and that type of thing, then maybe it's not this gentleness born of wisdom that we're talking about. And that's the truth that he's trying to get us to. Other thoughts? So when you compare some of the passages um, that we find uh, in some of these different influences, um, you might say that he is following a tradition, a tradition of passing on moral wisdom uh, to the next generation. And there is um, a, a similarity in the book of Proverbs. Uh, when the book of Proverbs talks about my son, listen to my teaching, that type of thing. Uh, it might be that overarching theme that's found not only in James, but uh, the whole wisdom tradition, the whole wisdom genre type thing. So notice also that James uses the teachings of Jesus. I think in one of my previous handouts, I gave you some cross references, but if this one, if you want to do some reading, um, you'll find some parallels between uh, the uh, epistle of James and the Sermon on the Mount. Some of them are almost near verbatim quotations. Others are just kind of vague allusions, but notice how many here in this chart here uh, the topic in James is reflected in both Matthew and Luke. Now, um, Matthew and Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount are a little bit different. So you'll notice that not every reference in Matthew is also found in Luke. So you'll notice that Matthew covers all these topics, Luke covers some of them. So there is a difference in the way you read the Sermon on the Mount between these two gospel accounts. But in the book of James, you have things, as I, I have listed in the first column there, uh, everything from trials um, to the tongue, to wisdom, to slander, to patience, and a prayer, all of these things are also found in the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have some time in your hand and you want to kind of keep your thumb in James and flip back to Matthew, primarily five through seven, you can kind of see where he gets a lot of the wisdom of Jesus. He reflects the wisdom of Jesus and uh, he wants to pass, <clears throat> pass on the wisdom of Jesus as well. Some thoughts there? Any thoughts on that? So maybe we can say that biblical wisdom is never intellectual attainment alone. It is a way of living in harmony, harmony with God and with other people. And um, what we find here in this paragraph is this idea of disorder is an idea of kind of communal confusion, anarchy, uh, things like that. And all, all we need to do is kind of look at different stories down through history of, of the history of nations and that, that go into anarchy and revolution and civil war and all these types of things. A lot of this disorder comes from the vying for power, uh, the desire for ambition, and that type of thing. So if, if I could reference for you, if you like history, there is a wonderful uh, 
podcast, actually there's a couple of them, that um, is put out by John Meacham, the historian. So this is not a, um, this is not necessarily Christian, although John Meacham is a Christian, it's not necessarily uh, totally Christian. So let me reference a few of them that I listen to. Uh, one of the podcasts is called It Was Said. So it kind of looks back on a lot of the speeches of important historical individuals and the influence it had upon their generation. Uh, an, another one is Hope Through History. Again, uh, John Meacham, Hope Through History, uh, looking at uh, a lot of the major things that have happened down through the course of history and how hope survived through all of that chaos and disorder that is often associated with. And there's a lot of um, sub stories here. It's not just talking about World War I and World War II. It's talking about a lot of different things. Um, he's just an excellent historian that, uh, that I think you might find interesting to listen to. So uh, you'll notice some cross references here as well. Uh, in particular, First and Second Corinthians talks a lot about disorder in the Corinthian church, um, a church that was very divisive. But I want you to remember how it began. Is if you were to look at First Corinthians, you would find that a lot of their divisiveness was found upon um, a lot of the uh, sectarian type of division of following in particular uh, uh, unique individuals that have the power and the voice to capture the attention. So I'm gonna read just a paragraph. You don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse 10, it says, now I appeal to you brothers and sisters by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and there be no divisions among you, but that you may be united in the same mind and the same purpose, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And then he goes on. But here's my point in that cross-reference. He finds that a lot of the divisiveness in the uh, Corinthian assembly is somehow being overwhelmed with the charisma of certain individuals. I'm a Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, uh, that type of thing. And when individuals are able to captivate a crowd, uh, what you'll find often is that the easiest thing to go along with is the mob. In other words, the group of people that have somehow the momentum and it, it takes a lot of courage um, to be able to stand up and, and voice dissent against what maybe the mob uh, says is the way to go. And I think in mentioning these couple of podcasts, Hope Through History, uh, it was said that there are individuals that stand out in history that's able to somehow take all the confusion and all the divisiveness within human experience and bring out of it a new vision that is kind of built upon this idea of gentleness born of wisdom from above. So before we look at the last two verses, let me see if you have any comments or questions uh, on uh, these uh, verses, verses uh, 14 through 16. Any thoughts there? So verses seven and 17 and 18 is kind of interesting. This is really uh, Bible nerdish, if you will, this section here. 
um, not that not the meaning of the verses, but the way it's structured is very, very interesting. So let's read it first. It says in verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality and hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Now look at your chart there, or the slide rather. The way James writes this, you don't see it in English, but you can see it in Greek. He alliterates four qualities with the letter E in Greek, and then the last three are illiterate with the letter A. So he talks about peaceful, considerate, submissive, and full of mercy. All, all four of those words start with the letter E, and the last three are illiterate uh, with the letter A, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. I told you that was really Bible nerdish. Um, but it's, it's this idea that he takes his time to pick his words very precisely here. And um, as he does so, if people are hearing this read, this would jump out at them the way it reads, because it's very, it's very uh, structured through the use of language that they would kind of sit up and take notice. So we all do this at times when we hear a sentence that is said we, that really hits us in some way because of the way it's verbalized. We sit up and take notice and we uh, then, you know, go, ooh, that was a, a great way of saying it. Well, I think most people that would hear these two verses probably would say the same thing uh, in these two verses. Oh, that's a great way of saying it. To those of us on the English side, it just seems to be kind of a random listing, I guess, of characteristics here. But it really is a literary technique that's going on in these two verses. So what is it saying? It's saying basically the result of God's wisdom is that it creates peace, first within oneself and then with other people. And um, he's talking about promoting consideration toward the need of other needs of other people, uh, possibly being submissive to the leadership of others to learn from them, that we don't always have to be the one that knows everything. And on top of it all is having this mercy, full of mercy and good fruits. He says, uh, mercy and, and good fruits go together, uh, being full of mercy. Um, then leads to peace, a harvest, and he uses this uh, imagery of a harvest of righteousness, doing what's right, because it was sown in peace for those who make peace. And it reminded me again of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 9, where Jesus says, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So here James is saying, uh, those works are done in a way that promotes peace. So maybe the best question we can ask in our families, in our workplace, and in our church is, how can I do what I'm doing for the Lord, serving him, wanting to serve him, but how can I do it in such a way that it brings about a peaceful, harmonious uh, relationship with other people. So I think that's where he's going with this. Um, I, I think this is a, um, a great passage that we can use to think a little bit about how to, um, how to continue to do what God has put on our heart to do and not to, um, to run over people with it, but to actually sow the type of qualities that builds uh, more harmonious relationships. So the way I'd like to summarize this, and then uh, we have several minutes, I'll just kind of see if you have some other thoughts that you want. So the reason I brought this new re uh, Revised Standard Version with me tonight 
is because in this study Bible here, there is a little summary of this uh, section in verses 13 through 18 that I'd like to read. So the question is asked, who is wise? And here's what the study notes say. True teachers impart godly wisdom that informs our faith and forms our character. Thus the emphasis on wisdom and understanding in contrast to the envy and selfish ambition that reveal immaturity and ungodliness, James advises about how to discern between so-called wisdoms. There is an earthly wisdom that is unspiritual, devilish, and leads to disorder and wickedness because it seeks a selfish human end. And there is a heavenly wisdom that makes one pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, merciful, and fruitful, and brings about godly results. The qualities of a godly teacher are described here, and as well, the qualities engendered in believers who are properly nurtured in the truth. Godly teachers and mature believers seek a harvest of righteousness from whom they say, for, from what they say and do. The image here is sowing peace, suggesting the righteousness becomes visible in persons who work for peace and live by peaceful rules. This line recalls Jesus' beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers. Self-promoting leaders work against righteousness, lacking as they do what verse 13 mentions as a good life and the gentleness born of wisdom from above. Just as true faith shows itself in good works, true wisdom shows itself in unselfish, godly conduct. I thought that was well summarized in this uh, paragraph here. So you have some other thoughts or questions, uh, comments that you want to make tonight? A general question. So when you talk about like James, you know, how the, the parallels between, you know, James and Ecclesiasticus, mm -hmm. how, I mean, and, and, and this occurs in other books too. I mean, how do, is that just serendipitous in, in some sense or is that, because one of the questions is how well did some of these individuals know some of the, um, you know, the older, the, the Old Testament scriptures that well and, and that they could design what they're writing or at least correlate? Or was it completely sort of serendipitous, if you know what I'm saying? Uh, some of it might be serendipitous, but I think when you go back to the charts that I showed you, there is really too much that's there for it to be uh serendipitous i think because james comes out of judaism there's not only a working knowledge of what we call our old testament but there is also within jewish culture and heritage uh those type of things that did not make it into protestant bibles that they would have been familiar with especially the apocryphal books uh, because they were written uh, between the Old and New Testament. Uh, it's often called the 400 silent years, but they're really not silent years. There's a lot of literature that's written. So I don't think um, the, the scope of knowledge, the scope of understanding, and the scope of tradition is, is especially in Judaism, within um, the Bible only. I think we all mm -hmm. see, also see this in the Apostle Paul, where he'll quote even um, uh, Greek philosophers at times. Um, he had a working knowledge of, of some of the Greek philosophers too. So some of it could be serendipitous. Uh, some of it might just be spirit inspired. But I do think it, it draws out of a pool uh, of working knowledge and familiarity. So um, I think, I think we have, yeah. we have those type of things too. So we grow up in our culture and there's certain things I think we are familiar with that other people might not know simply because it's a part of our culture to know that. So I don't care if it's, um, you know, if it's something like uh, uh, nursery rhymes, 
take that for example, uh, different things like that, that, or uh, bed, bedtime stories that we tell our kids or other types of stories, you know, that concern founding father like George Washington or uh, president like Abraham Lincoln and those types of things that have somehow become part of the fabric of who we are as Americans. Um, and I think that's true within Judaism as well. And so I've been talking about podcast a little bit well uh one let me give you another one that i listened to that um probably will help you uh see how in judaism the um there is a working knowledge not just of the torah but also all what all the rabbis had to say about the torah so there is a rabbi by the name of David Wolf. He is the rabbi of Mount Sinai Synagogue out in Los Angeles. He has a podcast. And you'll really like this podcast because it's he's really short. It's usually only about 10 minutes long, okay? It's called Off, Off the Pulpit, Off the Pulpit with David Wolf, W-O-L-P-E. And he does a tremendous job, not only talking a little bit about you know, uh, being Jewish, not only talking about uh, Jewish tradition, but even his understanding of what all the different rabbis said about different things is a part of who they are as an ethnic group that we call Jews. So I, if you look at the those, you'll see what I'm saying there. So that was a long-winded answer, uh, but, but I do think it's more than serendipity is the short answer. I think with certainly with Paul and others like that who are sort of PhD level scholars, mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying. I, I mean, I, I would certainly agree with it. Some of the others who are, now James is pretty well educated, but some of them might presume like, like Peter and others like that. <clears throat> My assumption was always they were pretty uneducated. Yeah, and, and I think people like uh, John um and peter they if you when you read their material i think they draw more upon experiences that they had with jesus yeah more than upon um this cross referencing so even the gospels um luke very educated um matthew although he was a tax collector wow he's he is the gospel writer that has the most uh quotations from the old testament which is interesting. Right, yeah. uh so you know um there's there's the element of research in the in the case of luke he says i've investigated everything others yeah. uh, had a working knowledge others learned i guess yeah uh, job training yeah. <laughs> that's a good point other comments, questions? All right. Well, then we'll uh, we'll close the, our time together tonight, and we're going to take a look at verses one through ten of chapter four next Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. You're welcome. Have a great week, everybody. See you soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.